National Labor Relations Board against Jones and Lachlan Steel Corporation, 1937. These are the facts. In 1935, Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act, which guaranteed to working men their right to organize for the purpose of collective bargaining with their employers. The law protected this right by outlawing employer attempts to interfere with union activity. In addition, the act created the National Labor Relations Board to enforce the law and protect the union man from anti-union practices. Jones and Lachlan was the fourth largest steel producer in the country. Its operations included mining ore, coal, and limestone, transporting these by company-owned ships and railroads, manufacturing steel, and storing and selling the finished product. Although the center of this vast system was in Pennsylvania, it employed thousands of men in many states throughout the country. The Beaver Valley Lodge No. 200 in one of the company's plants complained that Jones and Lachlan had fired several men because they were active in organizing the union. The union also complained that the company was discriminating against union men in its hiring policies and interfering with the workers' right to self-organization. The labor board upheld the union's complaint and ordered the company to rehire the discharged men and to cease other anti-union practices. Jones and Lachlan argued that the act was unconstitutional and could not be justified as a regulation of interstate commerce. The case came before the Supreme Court. The argument by the attorney for the National Labor Relations Board. May it please the court. The Constitution of the United States entrusts to the Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. The Congress may exercise this power by protecting interstate commerce from burdens imposed on it. It may remove those obstacles which prevent the free flow of commerce. Thus, when strikes and other industrial strife impede the stream of commercial activity across state lines, Congress may move against those evils. If necessary, Congress may attack those evils even before they occur, so long as the likelihood exists that interstate commerce will be affected. To hold otherwise would completely remove from Congress the power to deal effectively with a subject within its admitted scope of authority. For these reasons, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 is constitutional. The argument by the attorney for Jones and Lachlan. May it please the court. The National Labor Relations Act is not a true regulation of interstate commerce. It merely uses that power as a pretext for the regulation of employer-employee relations, a subject long reserved to the states in their control over local concerns. Manufacturing and production are not in or a part of interstate commerce, even though they may be preceded or followed by the movement of materials among the states. There exists no direct connection between labor relations and the course of interstate commerce. Furthermore, this law interferes with an employer's established and unchallenged right to manage his own business affairs. The hiring and firing of employees is a private concern, which the federal government may not regulate. In the present case, no strike took place, no production stopped, no goods intended for interstate shipment detained. Therefore, the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 is an unconstitutional invasion of rights reserved and belonging to individuals and the states. The Opinion of the Court by Mr. Chief Justice Hughes. The authority of the federal government may not be pushed to such an extreme as to destroy the distinction which the Commerce Clause itself established between commerce among the several states and the internal concerns of a state. That distinction between what is national and what is local in the activities of commerce is vital to the maintenance of our federal system. We think it clear that the National Labor Relations Act may be construed as to operate within the sphere of constitutional authority. 
It is a familiar principle that acts which directly burden or obstruct interstate or foreign commerce or its free flow are within the reach of the congressional power. Acts having that effect are not rendered immune because they grow out of labor disputes. Thus, in its present application, the statute goes no further than to safeguard the right of employees to self-organization and to select representatives of their own choosing for collective bargaining or other mutual protection without restraint or coercion by their employer. That is a fundamental right. Discrimination and coercion to prevent the free exercise of that right is a proper subject for condemnation by competent legislative authority. Fully recognizing the legality of collective action on the part of employees in order to safeguard their proper interests, we have said that Congress was not required to ignore this right, but could safeguard it. Hence, the prohibition by Congress of interference with the selection of representatives for the purpose of negotiation and conference between employers and employees. Instead of being an invasion of the constitutional right of either, was based on a recognition of the rights of both. The congressional authority to protect interstate commerce from burdens and obstructions is not limited to transactions which can be deemed to be an essential part of the flow of interstate or foreign commerce. Burdens and obstructions may be due to injurious actions springing from other sources. The fundamental principle is that the power to regulate commerce is the power to enact all appropriate legislation for its protection and advancement. That power is plenary and may be exerted to protect interstate commerce no matter the source of the dangers which threaten it. Intrastate activities, by reason of close and intimate relations to interstate commerce, may fall within federal control. It is apparent that the fact that the employees here concerned were engaged in production is not determinative. We are asked to shut our eyes to the plainest facts of our national life and to deal with the question of direct and indirect effects in an intellectual vacuum. Because there may be but indirect and remote effects upon interstate commerce in connection with a host of local enterprises throughout the country, it does not follow that other industrial activities do not have such a close and intimate relation to interstate commerce as to make the presence of industrial strife a matter of most urgent national concern. How can it be maintained that industrial labor relations constitute a forbidden field into which Congress may not enter when it is necessary to protect interstate commerce from the paralyzing consequences of industrial war? We have no doubt that Congress had constitutional authority to safeguard the right of respondents' employees to self-organization and freedom in the choice of representatives for collective bargaining.